Hello, and thank you for joining us on the Stay Healthy Knoxville podcast, brought to you by Simply Physio, aimed at helping you live an enjoyable, fit, and healthy life in and around our community of Knoxville, Tennessee. And now, here is your host, Dr. John Mark Chesney. Today, I have the opportunity to talk with Emily Kopeck. Emily has developed a reputation for being a go-to resource in the area for helping people restore their health through natural solutions. She has tons of people who have not found help or success through traditional Western medicine that she has been able to help. Um, she's a complete expert in the field, and we are fortunate to have her on the podcast today uh, and ultimately serving our community here in Knoxville. Uh, Emily is the owner and founder of Restorative Function medicine. Uh, she earned her degree in kinesiology from William and Mary, and she earned her master's in exercise science from Tennessee and went on to complete another master's uh, in physician assistant studies from South College. She's been practicing functional medicine for more than five years with previous work in women's health and family medicine. She is routinely expanding her knowledge and education and is a member of the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, the Institute of Functional Medicine, the International Society for Environmental Environmental Acquired Illness and the Tennessee Association of Physician Assistants. Uh, starting restorative functional medicine for Emily was very personal, and we're going to get a chance to hear her story today on uh, the podcast. Uh, but it's her passion to help people restore and reclaim their health from chronic and complex health issues. And all this stems from her own personal journey and experience. So, um, Emily, welcome to Stay Healthy Knoxville. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Oh, that's awesome. And we got had chance to hear some of your story when we were initially meeting in preparation for the podcast, but I, I know there's a, a whole lot more to it that I'm really looking forward to hear. And also, we're going to get into uh, the topic of um, gut health. Right. Right. Yeah, it's my favorite thing to talk about. Awesome. Awesome. So pretty sure that's going to come out in your story. Uh, but the second half of the podcast, um, we're going to get into more specific questions on um, yeah, answering questions that you probably have about your gut health, why it's important and what things things you can be on the lookout for, what you can do to really make sure that you have um, a healthy gut and digestive system. Definitely. It's very important. Well, yeah, I'd love to start with just really hearing your backstory, um, how you got involved in medicine. And I understand that took a turn into like functional medicine and had really like a shift, um, if you will, in your career focus on how you practice. So I'd love to hear that journey. Yes, definitely. I was so excited when I found functional medicine because I actually was diagnosed at the age of 13 with a thyroid autoimmune condition called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So super young, I started having health issues and it really started with typical hypothyroid symptoms, hair loss. But instead of gaining weight, I, I lost a bunch of weight because I really, I couldn't eat. I was very sick. And my mom just thought I was a teenager, uh, just worrying about body image and not eating. So here she was trying to force some food down my throat. But really, I just felt sick when I ate and really my numbers were so off. That's why. And I just was so lethargic. I really, I went to school somehow and still try to do sports, but I would just sit on the couch, just couldn't move. <laughs> and brain fog, my brain was just very, very foggy. And so eventually things got worse and my mom took me to the doctor and I had a great internist at the time, very good, very thorough. And I remember I got some blood work done and then I got a call, which would have been on I believe it was New Year's Eve um, and I was at a friend's house and my mom said, you need to come home. The doctor called me and we need to go pick up this medicine immediately. And knowing what I know now, hypothyroidism is not normally an emergency situation where you'd have to go do something. Um, but my levels were extremely high. You know, normal lab values are between 0 0.5 and, well, I say three. Some labs cut off at five for the TSH, which is the thyroid stimulating hormone, um, which is typically what most people are looking at when they're looking at thyroid labs. And then mine was 200. So <laughs> wow. it was very off that my doctor hadn't seen a level so high before. So of course he was concerned and got me on medicine. And then he said, you know, just take this little pill. It's, you know, it's all you need. And it may take a while. You might not feel good for a while because like with diabetes, when your levels get really high and they're first giving you insulin, you feel really crappy while the levels are coming levels are coming down. But, you know, at 13, it was I had a recent flare up that was not as easy. But at 13, it wasn't it wasn't too bad, you know, at that age when the levels were coming down. But I just remember thinking I just need to get my levels normal and I'll be fine again. Um, and that was not the case. Certainly things improved. I, I was I was really, you know, had a lot of things going on. So, I mean, I, I wasn't as tired and my hair stopped falling out, but I had that brain fog. I had muscle pain. I had things that never went away. I had reflux. I just had all these symptoms that in my mind, even as a young teenager, 
thought they had to be connected. Instead, it was, well, let's send you to the GI doctor. Let's send you to this doctor, women's health, because my menstrual cycles got messed up with it as well. And then nobody really connecting the dots to say this is all interrelated. Um, Even as a teenager, I just (laughs) remember thinking, here I am a situation where I'm on multiple medications, polypharmacy, and I'm 16. And and there's got to be some reason this has to be connected. Um, And my parents thought the same thing. So we would research and research. And, you know, my doctor was great. I mean, he drew the labs he could. But, you know, at the time, you know, he didn't think about look at other testing or specialty testing because he wasn't trained in functional medicine. And so he did the best he could with what he had and with what traditional medicine had to offer. And just, you know, it was a medication for this reflux or you need birth control, this or that, versus trying to find the root cause and it being connected. And all the time, my level still swung because the underlying issue for my Hashimoto's really hadn't been addressed. And that's typically what happens. People get on thyroid medication, but the underlying autoimmunity is is really never addressed. And and that becomes a big issue for a lot of people. And they can still feel bad with a normal TSH, they, but they still feel bad. Um, and they get blown off a lot or, I'm sorry, I have nothing else to help you. And I side note, because for some reason, I always like to stop and do teaching points when I talk. Um, But anyway, so that was my journey. But I just kind of kept going, Okay, I'm just going to have to live with this um, through high school and even at college. And and finally, in college, we started researching and and, uh, there was a doctor up in Boston, which is kind of crazy at the time. We had to go all the way to Boston to find somebody who considered. I didn't even know there was other thyroid medication options. I mean, I knew I had to be on it, but that there was even different options for medications. This was back in... I was probably, oh, I was probably a sophomore or junior in college. So it had been around 2005. Okay. I'm thinking back, I can't even remember the year I graduated. I believe it was around 2005. And and it's it's really interesting now, like, to have to go all the way up there to find somebody who specializes in, you know, telling me, you know, there's other medications. And, and Synthroid, which is the most common thyroid medication, is a T4 only drug, which if we look at active thyroid hormones in the body, T4 is more of a pro-hormone precursor that has to convert to free T3 at the cellular level for your cells to use. And I found out my body wasn't doing that well. And that by just adding in some T3, which is Cytomel is is the brand for that and finding that good combination, it, it did not fix all my problems because my story, my root cause really hasn't been addressed until more recent years, which we will probably, that would take a whole nother podcast to talk about. <laughs> but my cycles came back, my energy was better. All this thing that people told me wasn't related to my thyroid it ended up improving and I did feel better. And so for me, it was like this eye-opening thing. I have to go into medicine because I don't understand. It took me that many years just for something simple like that. So really, it was like just my passion and desire and under wanting to understand the human body and realizing it is interrelated. Even before I knew what functional medicine even was, sure. I was like, I have to I have to go into medicine because I need to help other people who were dealing with what I've de- dealt with all these years. I guess I can pause for any questions because that was a, a long spill about my journey just into medicine in general. I know my own journey was um, having injuries and experiencing physical therapy and right. Through that experience, um, you know, seeing a connection with like my own personality and my own drive and just uh, values and things that I really enjoy doing and kind of promoted me at a, you know, when I was in high school, you know, to like, hey, I think I could really enjoy doing and serving in this in this way. And um, yeah, to hear, you know, the same thing for you. So you said your journey brought you like far away from, um, were you, are you local? You grew up? I grew up in Bristol, Tennessee, Bristol, so okay, not East too Tennessee. far away. Yeah. So I am from East Tennessee. Sure. So, I um, did say I'd never moved to Knoxville. Knoxville. That did not happen. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, your journey took you like to like finding the deeper, you know, root cause and then you got into medicine. And so I understand that your first round of medicine was more traditional, right? Right. It was. I didn't really know much about functional medicine at the time, um, especially not in this area. I mean, on the West Coast, it's a little bit more common earlier, but it's really exploded in the last five to 10 years. But, you know, at the time I didn't know really know about it. Mm -hmm. So I thought it would be a good idea, you know, family medicine out of school for the first year just to really get a good background. I mean, you see everything. And I was out in Harriman, so I got to see a lot of things. And it was really good to get under my belt. But again, you know, even when I did that and before I got into women's health, I started noticing people coming in with these complaints with normal blood work. And I'm thinking, this is not in their head. There's something going on. So it still was that desire in me. But I did enjoy that first year of family medicine to get that broad experience and things like that right out of school. So Sure. And so was there an event or like uh, an aha moment that really changed your trajectory? It's not like you were almost on this course 
like towards functional medicine from early on, right? right as, yeah. as a teenager, but you didn't really find it until at some point in your career, right? Was there like, tell right. us about that. Yes. Yes. So I actually ended up switching to women's health because I loved women's health. Actually, as a student, I didn't think I would like it. And I loved it mainly because I was dealing with a lot of thyroid and hormones looking back. And I liked following women throughout their pregnancy. But um, my pharmacy teacher in PA school, he came to visit me in women's health and he had joined and started working at a compounding pharmacy called Heartland Apothecary. And they do bioidentical hormones and more natural type things. And so he said, um, you know, Emily, I'm having a conference soon. He knew I was more natural minded and, and that that might be something that would be something I would be interested in. And so he asked me to go with him to a conference. And little did I know that conference really was what changed my trajectory all those years ago. They didn't just talk about hormones. They talked about gut health and getting to the root cause and how 75% of the immune system is in the gut. And that's where you start at trying to figure out what's going on with the person. They talked about thyroid and adrenals and hormones and all these things. And that was my aha moment because I said, I have to do this. Um, I have to figure out how I can do this. And actually, he and the owner at the time had talked about getting a functional medicine practice in the back of their facility because they had some extra space. And they asked me if I would be um, interested because I had, when I came back from the conference, I had started um, applying my knowledge, you know, that I had learned there with patients. And I started noticing, hey, patients are starting to do better. I mean, to me, it was really the missing piece. And so I jumped on that opportunity. And I guess that was about seven, seven years ago, six or seven years ago. And I have not looked back and I don't think I could go back. Uh, but to me, that conference and, and him inviting me, um, that's what changed my trajectory moving forward with my career. Even taking one step back, you know, we're using this term functional medicine. Right. Like if somebody were to ask you, what it is, Emily? <laughs> what million is, dollar question. What is functional medicine? <laughs> I get that question a lot. And, and this is my simple answer. It's a, it's a complex answer. But my simple answer is that it's root cause medicine. So our goal is to figure out why you're dealing with what you are. And it's multi-system, meaning we look at all the systems together and we don't just look at this versus this versus this. And we also address the whole person, body, mind, spirit, because we all know stress can affect the immune system. And it's really important that we address the whole person and that, you know, so we talk about stressors in life, you know, not just about what's your nutrition and what's your lab value, but hey, what's going on in your life? Things like that. Takes into account the whole person and it is evidence-based research as well. All the testing we do, some people think it's hooky. That is evidence-based and it is research-based. And I'm telling you that the testing that we do, we find results and it matches with what's going on with the patient. Um, so it is evidence-based as well. So I like to refer to people to know that as well. It is science-based too. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think some people when you start talking about the gut yeah. um, and even, you know, some things like, you know, brain fog or right. you know, things like that where I'm yeah. there's definitely symptoms, but it's, um, you know, how do you like as being a medicine, you want to be able to like what measure it? Exactly. And so thankfully now we're getting uh, more testing and specialty testing to be able to do that. So, yeah. So you were introduced, uh, you said through the com through the conference. Right. It was a compounding pharmacy uh, conference through the PCCA was the name of the compounding pharmacy. And there was a bunch of other um, practitioners there that were, you know, like minded, you know, trying to combine or bring into their traditional medicine practice and functional medicine and or they were full time functional medicine practitioners themselves. Sure. So, um, so you mentioned the, you know, the, the gut, the importance of, you know, the, the guts has, how's, how's that fit in with your own journey of health? Right. I mean, gut health is really the place that I start with most patients because my thyroid problem was due to an autoimmune condition, which most people that have hypothyroidism, the most common cause is Hashimoto's. So your body is attacking your thyroid, your body's attacking itself. So you want to figure out why. And though all my cause, like I said, was it's multifactorial. There's a lot of things that go into mine, which is genetics, some environmental exposure of mold, things like that. But but working on my gut health was really the number one thing. I found out I was sensitive to gluten um, and some other foods and removing those food sensitivities helped my thyroid antibodies, helped me feel better. And I started working on, you know, getting the gut healthy. And, and really in, in functional medicine, we do what's called a 4R approach to getting your gut healthy. And that's kind of a simple simplified way that I explain it to people. And the first step is, is removal. So we're wanting to remove inflammatory foods. And, and I don't tell every patient, hey, you have to give up all these foods just because it's a fad diet. It's fun. But basically what happens with the gut, you have an intestinal barrier that basically keeps things that should be in the gut 
in the gut and not out in the immune system. So what happens is you get insults, injuries from whether it's antibiotic use, whether it's stress, different causes cause those tight junctions in your gut to spread apart. And that's where you hear the term leaky gut, or we call it intestinal permeability, because what happens is these large, hard to digest food particles that are more inflammatory, like gluten and dairy and things like that can get out in the system and your body is, is, is attacking because it thinks, hey, this shouldn't be out here. And it's really a misfiring that happens. And we call it a molecular mimicry. And so really it's, it's removing the foods that we know that can be inflammatory, especially if the gut is damaged. Um, and there is a connection between Hashimoto's and gluten sensitivity and really Hashimoto's and celiac disease because some, you know, there is a percentage of people that can get, which is, you know, an actual allergy to gluten versus the sensitivity. So there is that connection there. So that first step is removing the inflammatory foods and inflammatory pathogens because when bacteria and different pathogens break down in the gut and if that intestinal barrier is not intact and tight, the breakdown can produce a chemical we call lipopolysaccharide, which gets out in the immune system and is inflammatory. So the first step is to remove inflammatory foods and pathogens. And we do stool testing at my office. I use something called the GI map. And stool testing has advanced majorly with functional medicine. If you go to your regular doctor, you know, they might have you do a stool collection, but they're just looking at a couple things and you're relying for that person to look under the microscope. And really, if you're relying on that, it really takes multiple stool specimens to really see anything. But ours is DNA based. So even the dead DNA of pathogens, it can pick up looking for bacteria, yeast, parasites. It also looks for what is that lining that intestinal integrity? How are you breaking down foods? Is there, you know, some food sensitivities going on? So it's a really good look at what's happening specifically in your gut. And we tend to use natural antimicrobials um, versus prescription antibiotics to fix that imbalance because antibiotics, prescriptions are kind of what can cause that to happen in the first place. Hmm. So what's an example of an antimicrobial? So one of my favorite is actually called Biocidin by Biobotanical Research, and it combines... So it's a um, supplement? Yeah, it's, yeah. Okay. It's different supplements that will combine natural things like garlic and wormwood and black walnut and different things like that, um, berberine, that are great natural antimicrobials that aren't going to kill off all the good bugs in your gut, but will get rid of those imbalances. And the nice thing about the stool test is it tells us and shows us where those are. Tell us just a little bit more as we're kind of going along the, the timeline of, yeah. of your journey. We've kind of got up to the point of, you know, You've gotten all into, you know, functional medicine and right. what that is. Yeah. Um, and so now like this next chapter is also you starting your your practice, right. um, uh, restorative functional medicine. Uh, what if you bring us up to speed on kind of what brought you to kind of that point of like, hey, I'm going to. I'm going to start, you know, my practice. Right. Well, it's 2020. So <laughs> I'm just going to stop there. Um, no, I'm just kidding. So, you know, I practiced after I was at that clinic um, behind Heartland Apothecary uh, for a year, my supervising physician um, actually passed away from cancer. And so I was looking for other jobs. And um, my friend, um, Danae Miley, who actually was cranial, craniosacral therapist, um, who I really love, she does really great work. She actually connected a bunch of us that were like-minded, all wanting to do functional medicine and we opened a clinic called Knox Wellness and so I was there for about four and a half years myself and Emily Cleveland um, Job who is the only uh, one of two naturopath doctors um, in Tennessee and, and we were there for multiple years and then after that over the course of several years a couple of us ended up leaving and then at that point I did take some time off because some things that had come up on my journey I had basically part of my cause of my Hashimoto's is, is mold exposure and I had lived in a house with lots of mold and it sent my TSH back up to 150 again. So it wasn't pleasant and it wasn't as easy as it was recovering at the age of 13. But anyway, long story short, I took some time off to focus on my health. Um, and then I came back to work as an independent contractor for one of my friends. And if you'd asked me at the beginning of this year, if I planned to own my own business, I don't think I would have told you yes. But um, it just, you know, I would say this summer when I started coming back, I started having the desire to have my own clinic. I enjoyed working with my friend, but I would have had to make a more of a long-term commitment. And just this desire to have my own practice to really help help people and just all these great ideas of things that I wanted to do really it would require me to have my own. And and I'm really very glad that I made the decision to do so because it's it's really I'm able to do my passion and able to, you know, decide and have a say in, in how it's run. Um, and that's really been the best of both worlds and to have my own staff, which um, I have a really great staff that I really love. So I, I, I guess it was a God thing I can say because uh, I feel like this summer is when he really called me into wanting to have my own practice. So I'm really glad I did it. It was tough those first couple months. Yeah. <laughs> 
uh, but I'm glad I did it. I'm not too far ahead of you in my own practice, three years. So yeah, the journey it's been, it's, uh, I, I'm, I enjoy the journey. There's, there's days and moments and sometimes mornings when I'm just like, what in the world have yeah. I got myself into? I'm yeah. sure any small business owner yeah. you know, feels the same thing, but yeah, looking back, like the perks and benefits of being able to create something that you really, yeah, is about, you know, your values and your passion and serving, you know, a need in the community is, um, is well worth it. So I commend you on your your step of, of faith and and uh, and stepping into your practice. Thank you. We're going to um, take a break um, here, a word from our sponsor, and come back and we'll talk about um, the rest of the R's. Yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> Sorry, I can talk a lot about gut health. So, yeah. um, and then get back into um, talking more specifically about gut health, since I know that's a big part of where you focus. So uh, we'll take a break and then come back for the second half. Stay Healthy Knoxville is sponsored by Simply Physio a physio clinic that equips and empowers you to live your life to the fullest so that you can enjoy the things you love to do and be the person you are made to be. Simply Physio specializes in helping people get back to a healthy and active lifestyle, living free from pain and medication and avoiding unnecessary surgery. Stay tuned until the end of the episode to receive a special gift from Simply Physio and enjoy listening to the rest of the episode. Hey guys, welcome back uh, to the second half of our episode uh, here with Emily Kopeck. Uh, we have been talking about functional medicine, thyroid, her own journey, and then we're getting more specific, um, specifically into gut health. And so where we stopped off uh, was um, talking about, uh, I guess, the four R's of functional medicine, right? But yeah, four R approach to gut health, which gut is health. which is the the foundation, I would say, of functional medicine. Okay, awesome. Um, so the first one, uh, the R, is remove. Your Paying good attention. All right. All right. I don't know. We'll see if I can remember all four of them. But um, I'll do a quiz for you. <laughs> what are the other three, even though I haven't mentioned them yet? That's right. That's right. Um, I'm going to be taking notes. <laughs> Ready for my pop quiz. All right. I guess it's not a pop quiz if I know it's coming. Ready for my quiz. All right. Well, um, so remove and then the second. Yeah, it's actually replace um, digestive enzymes lost because it's a big, big thing for most people is that they're not digesting and breaking foods down well. And when that happens, not only are you not absorbing nutrients, but it's it's a feeding ground for bacteria to feed on undigested food. So we work with, uh, there's supplements we use, digestive enzymes or even digestive bitters, you know, things that get you digesting, ginger and different things like that, that get your body's digestive enzymes going naturally. Or some people need a whole digestive enzyme complex and some people actually need betaine HCL, which is, you know, stomach acid because a lot of people have reflux and they're put on proton pump inhibitors to lower all stomach acid when the problem is they have low stomach acid. And so their body's trying to overproduce and they get reflux symptoms. So people actually get a really big improvement with reflux and things like that with digestive enzymes with the HCL because of the low stomach acid issue, uh, particularly thyroid patients, hypothyroid patients have low stomach acid, which is why back in my teens, I ended up on an acid reducer when really it's low stomach acid being the problem. So the step two is to replace digestive enzymes lost. And another thing I will just comment on digesting is we don't take the time to chew, chew, chew. We, we gulp, gulp, gulp. And you really want to slow down when you eat. It's like monotonous, just chew, chew, chew. But that's really getting your body ready to absorb the nutrients you're eating. So that's the second step. If you're not absorbing and getting the breakdown of the food and the nutrients, then, you know, that's not doing you a lot of good. To eat slowly. Eat slowly. Mm -hmm. If I were to ask you more specifically, what does that actually mean? <laughs> how, how, how? Well, you with your little, how many, how many, I don't know. It's like, how many times do you chew? I mean, basically, even starting with not taking big gulps of food, it's taking the time to slowly cut up your food, chew that little piece of meat. I mean, I don't 20, I mean, maybe 20, 30 times. I mean, mm -hmm. you're going, oh, that seems a little excessive, but you want to really chew, chew, chew. It gets all the digestive enzymes um, going. So I would say just be more cognizant of, hey, am I just going one, two, chew when I'm swallowing this or am I taking the time? You know, sit down and focus more on mindful eating and relaxing. You know, other countries do that. They spend two hours at a meal and they're healthier than us, but we're just like 20 minutes shoving it down. So maybe not a specific formula, but just being more mindful of. And that, does that ultimately help with absorbing of the nutrients it because does. you're yeah, helping it, the digestive process? Right, like, exactly. From your mouth, from exactly. the start. Yeah. And, and now that we're on just talking about digestion, most of your nutrients are actually absorbed and assimilated in your small intestines. And I see a lot of people, it's not just 
you know, large intestines that have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and they're not absorbing any nutrients and they'll have brain fog and bloating and gas and all these things. So it's important to look at both the small and the large intestines um, and, and, and realize how our whole digestive system system kind of works together to help so sure um remove oh gosh now i'm gonna forget my r's replace um. <laughs> re-inoculate oh gosh i was thinking i'm just gonna sit here speaking of brain fog i'm not gonna remember one of my r's uh re-inoculate and okay. that's when we talk about pre and probiotic so probiotics are very popular everybody wants to take a probiotic but it's really important to remember that prebiotics are actually what feed our good bacteria that's a big word. Uh, i'm sorry that's a big word re-inoculate yeah, i know <laughs> i'm trying to think of uh, like Rebuild? Yeah. Uh, well, there's restore. That's step four. Okay. Okay. Reinoculate is giving your body the good microbes that you've lost um, because with our diet and nutrition, a lot of people don't have enough good bacteria. And so e e even just thinking about how many uh, soil-based nutrients are we eating, right? And they even have soil-based probiotics now because we're not getting the nutrients from our soil. And that goes to chemicals being used, Roundup, just not getting a lot of, uh, of the nutrients from our food. So I think that's why it's really important that when you're looking at, you know, your food, getting clean food, organic when possible, um, so that you're getting nutrients. That's a little side note. But we're having a problem with not having enough good bacteria because of just really the toxins that we have in our food and environment um, this day and age. Sure. So, uh Reinoculate with right. um, probiotics. Yep, and prebiotics. And prebiotics actually are what feed your good microbes that are already in your gut. Those are foods like garlic, onion, artichoke hearts, fibers. And so sometimes I'll put people on prebiotics. However, you need to make sure that all bacterial overgrowth is taken care of first because prebiotics can feed overgrowth as well. So I always just work with people to make sure they have a healthy gut um, and that it's mainly just low, good bacteria that they have before they go on prebiotics. But I do encourage people to incorporate garlic and onions, those type of things, unless they have bacterial overgrowth, specifically small intestinal bacterial overgrowth into their nutrition. Probiotics are transient. I mean, if you stop taking them, they're out of your system in about seven days. So really, I'm using probiotics as research-based natural antimicrobials, meaning this bacteria has been strain or has been studied to help with this condition. So if you have constipation, I'm going to be using something different, you know, more bifidobacterium species versus di diarrhea dominant, like a lactobacillus type of species. Depending on what is going on in your gut, I'm going to use a different probiotic and I'm going to use it in a way that it's a natural antimicrobial versus just, hey, take this probiotic every day. Because I think a lot of people just think this one probiotic, I'm going to get one with 50 billion strains and it's going to fix my problems and not necessarily. So I think that's really important to remember about probiotics. Now, um, as you're working with clients, how do you determine like what bacteria needs they have? Yeah, that's a good testing. question. Yeah, testing. I mean, you can look through the stool test and it'll show us how much of different each different good bacteria you have and also symptoms and things like that constipation most people la uh, lack a bifidobacterium which is a type of good bacteria um, and people with more diarrhea dominant are going to lack more of the lactobacillus type species lactobacillus rhamnosus is a good probiotic for that so partly stool testing partly symptoms and if you do have the overgrowth of bacteria I'm going to be very careful about what probiotics I use for that and actually I'm a big fan of something called Saccharomyces boulardii which actually is a beneficial yeast. It goes in and crowds out bad bacteria. It helps leaky gut. And so it's it's really what you want is a balance it, it, and not dysbiosis, but you want it to all be in a really good balance. And so you want something, a probiotic that's going to really have a balancing effect on your microbes, if that makes sense. Sure. Do you look at um, like food sensitivity testing? We do. Absolutely. Now, I will tell you, some people light up all across the board and that's really because their gut is unhealthy. If you're reacting to 80 foods, your gut's unhealthy. Sure. And I've even heard, I don't know, different opinions on food sensitivity testing and their reliability of them and I don't know what what your opinion is or from your you know professional standpoint. Right, and I think that's a good point. They're not a hundred percent. Really, the only way to hundred percent know your food sensitivities is to do a strict elimination diet, and you remove the big inflammatory foods and you take them out of your diet at least thirty days. But a lot of people just want to do the test because at least thirty days. But it truly takes ninety days to get an antibody out of your system to really know. Hey, I'm taking it out of my my um, system, and then I'm going to try just a little bit and see if I react to it. It really sometimes takes. 90 90 days to get that fully out of your system. But a lot of people you'll hear, do, hear doing like whole 30s and things like that. And they're removing the big inflammatory foods for 30 days. Then they're slowly adding them back in one at a time. So that's truly the gold standard. But a lot of people, the food sensitivity test will at least gauge, hey, I need to watch this or let me get rid of the ones that are high versus low response. So it's not perfect, but it can be helpful. And again, like I said, one caveat is people who react to 80 million foods. It's because their gut's unhealthy and we need to get the gut healthy. 
it's not that they don't need to eat a hundred of these foods for the rest of their life, just take them all out because there's nothing left to eat. I mean, you want to remove while you're healing, but the goal would not be for them to have to remove so many foods right. forever. Right. So it does have its place where it's helpful. We got remove. All right, <laughs> quiz replace, time. Re-inoculation. And then you already mentioned the fourth, restore. Look at you, 100 <laughs> on your quiz. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, so tell us about restore. Have we gotten there yet? Right, so restore is restoring the gut lining and it's the last step. You know, you'll hear a lot of people talking about collagen and L-glutamine and different things to help heal the gut lining. And it's important to do those, but it's also important to remember you need to be doing the other steps as well. And it doesn't necessarily mean you can't do all the steps at the same time, but you really want to make sure when you're on that four step restoring that you've taken care of the pathogens and you've done all the other steps. But basically that's healing, making those tight junctions that I mentioned that spread apart and we get the term leaky gut, intestinal permeability, really restoring those linings, making those tight junctions back where they should be so that you don't have this leakage of stuff out into the immune system. And again, you know, part of that is um, stress reduction because stress really, really affects that gut lining, antibiotic use, like getting rid of whatever chronic NSAID use, different things that might damage that gut lining and using nutrients like L-glutamine and aloe vera and DGL and collagen and different things to really restore. And that's the last step. If we have um, yeah listeners that are really interested in you know this topic, if um, a few questions I would wonder is like, so how long does it take to go through this process? It's a good question. I tell people to get the gut healthy. Now, some people can feel better in as little as four to six weeks. There can be an initial period when we're killing off the bad bugs that people are not feeling great. It's called die off. We can experience when you're, especially with yeast, if there's a lot of yeast. But then generally, some people can feel good as soon as four to six weeks. But I tell people, really, it takes six months to a year to make a major improvement in the gut microbiome. But when you really focus on it, it makes a big difference and people end up feeling much better. So once somebody's gone on this journey, you know, through for restoring the gut and the gut lining, I would imagine there's then some level of continuation need of, I don't know, uh, balance, keeping things balanced. Exactly, exactly. Yes, exactly. And part of that would be, okay, did they have some major food sensitivities that we just know, okay, that they really just need to avoid? You know, for some people, if you've got autoimmune conditions, gluten just is a tough one. People specifically with like eczema and allergies and things like that, dairy can just be one that you really just kind of need to stay away from. So part of it's learning what food you can get add back in and, and really how do you just need to adjust your diet and maybe keeping sugar out. And then there's preventative supplements, maintenance supplements, and that might be, you know, the probiotic that we talked about specifically for your case, uh, that beneficial yeast, Saccharomyces boulardii, being on that. And then, I mean, I do most people, like I'll do a stool test in a lot of my patients like once a year just to kind of recheck, okay, what's the balance happening and or if they have a flare up and we need to pull back out that natural antimicrobial or we might have a maintenance dose of that natural antimicrobial. It's different for each person though. And that's the thing I love about functional medicine is it's individualized and it's different for each person. But yes, there is going to be some sort of maintenance after that. What kind of symptoms would somebody be on the lookout for that would call into question their gut health? We've already mentioned a few, um, like such as, you know, the brain fog, kind of some lethargic loss of energy. Yeah. What else would reflux? Right. Right. Um, What other big ones do you you find that you find a strong connection with with gut health. Right. And that's a good question. So I want to f- say first to the point to the ones you already mentioned, the gut is the second brain, right? So there's connections between the gut and the brain. And that's why you'll get the lethargy, the gut, you know, the brain fog. You, you will get those symptomatic symptoms. It's not always just constipation and bloating and diarrhea. Now, those are things to watch out for. People that have bacterial overgrowth, a lot of times will have diarrhea. They'll have gas and bloating. Some of them don't go to the bathroom for days at a time. And then in, they'll say, I woke up this morning and my belly was flat. And at the end of the day, I've barely eaten anything. It's all the way out here. That that definitely normally signifies a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth for sure, because things are not moving through as they should. It's a motility issue. So I would say bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation, like you said, brain fog, fatigue, eczema. I want to talk about skin issues and rashes. People that come to me with skin issues and rashes, it is almost always something imbalanced. In the, it's, it's a reflection of what's happening in the gut, um, allergies, eczema. Because when you get bacterial overgrowth and imbalance, you can get histamine issues and the mast cells in the gut are not stabilized. So that's another big thing that I would say. And some people, joint pain is another big one, especially for food sensitivities. They'll sure. say, my joints really hurt. And then like if somebody has these skin 
condition you mentioned eczema and um psoriasis psoriasis yes definitely what's um what's been your experience with connecting that with the gut like working with people and like what type of like results they see right i mean uh, almost certainly they have to remove inflammatory foods dairy is a big one gluten's a big one um and almost certainly there's an imbalance in in the gut flora and one of the subcategories of our stool test that looks at potential autoimmune triggers. And these are bacteria that are studied and shown that can cause autoimmunity. And almost always I'm seeing people with psoriasis and and different autoimmune conditions to test positive for one of those. But I'm normally seeing an imbalance in the bacteria. Like I said, normally almost always there's food sensitivities that are really triggering that. And almost always they're showing leaky gut. And that's why they're having the issues of um, the systematic rashes and things like that from the gut. Well, yeah, a few other questions. Um, One, um, do you find these issues, I know you, for your own, uh, you know, story, like, you know, you said you're around 13 when you started having symptoms. Do you work with or find issues with even younger population kids um, yes. with gut issues? Yes. And- I'm seeing really young children with gut problems. And I think it's a combination of things. I think it's the combination of increased antibiotic use, more kids having to be born via C-section, moms having to get antibiotics at the time of delivery. And then I think the quality of the foods, you know, I think those are all big things. I'm seeing lots of eczema and kids, different rashes, behavioral issues, um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and my little kids um, doing a lot of stool testing in the kiddos. And so I take it, I mean, it's a similar process, right? Right, right. I mean, you you can't use Taylor. the same dose of some <laughs> things. You know, some kids are super picky. So how do you get a two-year-old to say, you know, you got to eat this, but not this. So it's a little bit more of a battle. So sometimes we can't be as strict, but certainly you can, can make best. a big difference <laughs> and it's best to get them young. I wish I would have known about this before, you know, what happened to me did, but you know, I can help other people. So besides, uh, food and supplements, are there other influencers, positive or negative, that will affect gut health? Right, right. Stress. <laughs> In fact, if you can do one thing, I know we all say stress less, 2020. Sure. I've had so many patients have gut flare-ups because stress directly affects that gut lining. So meditation, you know, whatever relaxes you, exercise positively, you know, influences your gut health and increases immunity. Um, so positive, I would say, relaxation techniques, exercise, and just you know, having fun and the negatives would be the stress, you know, things like that, kind of triggering that away from nutrition and, and different things like that. Um, just the emotional health and things there is, is really important. How does um, alcohol affect? Yeah, that's a good question, like, yeah. right? People aren't don't want to have to hate me, right? If they have to take away their glass of wine. <laughs> that's right. Like red wine, isn't that good for everything, right? I know, right? <laughs> well, I'm not going to Red wine get... and dark chocolate. I know people will not come and see me, right? Well, alcohol, you know, if consumed regularly and it, it and in excess can definitely damage the gut lining and is inflammatory. And then as much as um, I'm a red wine fan, there's all you have to think about the toxins and things like that. And, um, you know, a lot of growers are not growing in an organic fashion and things like that. I think in um, occasional moderation, it can be OK, but certainly any excess could uh, could cause some gut damage there. Well, Emily, thanks so much for your thorough understanding and explanation of um, understanding the guts and how, yeah, hopefully our listeners here, if you're listening and you have any of those symptoms um, that's, uh, and if, if you haven't explored, um, you know, gut health and digestive health, this could be a really a game changer, um, right, in in recovering from health, and especially if other um, other options that you've tried uh, hasn't, hasn't worked. So thanks so much for bringing that information to the community community to our listeners um, and and beyond. We like to always finish with a few questions about Knoxville and uh, just encouraging people to get out and explore Knoxville and love to hear what you have to add um, to encourage that. But Emily, lo- love to hear about um, something on your bucket list um, in and around Knoxville, greater East Tennessee that you've um, been wanting to do. That is a good question. Well, you know, East Tennessee is beautiful and has all the mountains and hiking and I know the last couple of years have been so crazy. I really haven't had a chance to go out and see nature as much as I was as I would like. Maybe do a hike, um, just go explore some areas in, in nature because to me that's the place that I just relax the most is out sure. in nature. So I think getting out and doing a hike or, you know, exploring some place in East Tennessee, just walking around and just looking at at, at nature is probably as, as silly as that sound, I think that's something that sounds great to me right now. Yeah. Any um, any place in particular that you haven't been that, uh, that someone's recommended that you'd, oh. you'd like to go to? 
Well, I'll, I'll have to get in better shape before I try to do Mount Lacan, Mount you know. <laughs> so, gosh, I, I can't think off the top no, of my head. I mean, there's Mount lots. Of, I'll have to definitely get in. Get, I'll have to come see you before I do that, okay? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, but um, no, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I have been to Cades Cove, and it's really beautiful there. And I actually had, had done that hike a couple years ago, and that's really nice where the waterfall is is up there. So I need, if, definitely some suggestions <laughs> on some easier kind of getting in there slower hikes right. or just any pretty nature, you know. Um, I'm sure there's lots of areas I haven't had a chance to explore yet, but sure. there's tons of beauty in this area. So Yeah, our last podcast, um, uh, Lee Martin suggested um, Oz- um, Ozone Falls. Now, um, where is that? Is and that- so that's on, or uh, we may have an opportunity this weekend to go see it. It's, um, it's over towards, um, driving towards Cookville. Okay. Um, it's halfway like around Crossville. Okay. But evidently it's right off um, the interstate. Uh, like it's a really beautiful falls, but um, I haven't been there yet, but um, I'm hoping to knock that off the, my our bucket list yeah. maybe this weekend yeah. since we're heading that direction. But one that you can maybe pencil in or um, check out. Well, the second question, what's some of favorite place, uh, favorite thing to enjoy outside and um, to uh, around Knoxville? Well, I love Market Square. I'm a downtown fan. I just love the quaint shops and I love local restaurants. I like to support locals. So I love to just go downtown. You know, when, when they did have the farmer's market down there, I loved going on Saturday mornings and hearing the people play and um, just walking around Market Square. That is my number one uh, favorite place to go in Knoxville. They moved it from um, downtown so they could crowd control okay. with COVID. It's in an outdoor space. I forget. Okay. It's a square because, you know, my husband, uh, just a side note, sells craft chocolate. So he's worked the farmer's okay. market. So yeah, Lirio chocolate. You're welcome, Chris. Um, but <laughs> Say it yeah, again. Lir- Lirio chocolate. Lirio. Okay. Yeah, L-I-R-I-O. It's really good. Dark chocolate, clean chocolate. I approve. <laughs> but yeah, so they moved. They're not downtown anymore. But I used to. Lo- I'd love to go downtown Knoxville. That's my my favorite place. I'm pretty sure I've had his chocolate. Do, do oh. they sell it at Honeybee? Yeah, they do. They yes, do. It yes. is excellent. Yes. It is excellent. That's my so, husband. Yeah. Awesome. That's yeah. that's fun. It's fun to put that connection together. Favorite restaurant? That's a tough one. I probably got like five or six I really like. I love Tomato Head. Um, I love Shivo. Why is the name escaping me? The Greek restaurant in the old city. Keffy. Gotcha. Yeah, Keffy is very good. I've been there good. a few times too. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Emily, uh, as we've been talking about functional medicine, gut health, what would you leave our listeners with your your top recommendation or tip um, on the topic? All right. Well, there's so many things you can do for your gut and you can get on and research and, and some people come to me and they've tried so hard, but they have so many supplements and they just need guidance and, and direction. And, and I would say, you know, it's I think it's really important, especially to work with somebody to help guide you towards what you really need. But I think the first step is, you know, really working on stress levels, reducing your stress and look at your eating and say, hey, how can I, you know, make changes here and and lasting changes? So maybe we're not going gung ho and taking every food out, but what's one thing I can do in my diet to kind of clean it up? Maybe I can reduce sugar. Maybe I can take some sodas out. I know that was more than one thing, but those are just some small steps, stress reduction, cleaning up the diet, um, especially with the stress of 2020. Mm-hmm. It's been a rough year. So um, trying to relax and, and get with other people and have a, you know, whether it's on Zoom, maybe it's not in person, but trying to get with family, however that may be, and just have a relaxing holiday. Somebody wants to get in contact with you to utilizing some of your expertise for their own personal health, what's the best way for them to contact you? Yeah, so um, we have a website and it is www.restorativefunctionalmedicine.com. If you're wanting to just read a little bit more about what we do, you can also fill out a simple contact form and it'll come to us via email. You can email us at support at restorativefunctionalmedicine.com or you can call us. Our phone number is 865-367-9506. Um, and my office manager, Kelly, is super great and super nice and she's always good about getting back to people quickly. Perfect. Perfect. Well, um, thanks again. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to the topic. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Well, stay healthy, Knoxville. Thank you for tuning in to the Stay Healthy Knoxville podcast, brought to you by Simply Physio. If your pain is preventing you from staying healthy and active, and you'd like to avoid surgery, pain medicine, or just want to get back to doing the things you love in and around Knoxville, we offer both a free ebook and free over the phone consultation to help you figure out the root cause of your pain and the next best steps for resolving it. Find our ebooks online at simplypt.com slash health dash tips. There you will find ebooks for topics such as neck and shoulder pain, lower back and hip pain, knee pain, and TMJ. 
These quick to read reports will provide you with expert tips, tricks, and exercises to help solve your pain from the comfort of your own home. Just visit simplypt.com slash health dash tips to download your ebook and have it delivered directly to your inbox. We also offer free, no obligation phone consultations with a doctor of physical therapy to Knoxville area residents. Just call us at 865 351 0615 or visit us at simplypt.com and click the talk to a PT button on the home page to schedule a call with us. Thanks again for joining us and we will see you next time on the Stay Healthy Knoxville podcast.